Okay. okay. And so, it looks like uh, I hear the uh, the siren, uh, the noon siren here in Fort Atkinson. So that's pretty much uh, our go time. And uh, so, Mike, why don't I just start here uh, in, in this case uh, and welcome all of, uh, well, first of all, you, Mike, again, of course, our, our co-host, and Rick Grant, our presenter today We're, uh, with the Minor Institute. We're glad to have you with us. We're glad to have a number of uh, listeners out across the country uh, and, and viewers with us today. And uh, we appreciate your attendance and uh, interest. And we also, of course, appreciate the input of our uh, sponsor today, uh, Muriel, and their uh, best-in-class dairy program. And we uh, we thank them for their uh, support. Now, Mike, uh, with that, I'll let you uh, introduce our presenter. Very good, Steve. Well, it's always a pleasure to uh, be on the Horde's Dairyman uh, monthly webinar. As we all know, it's scheduled for the second Monday of the month. And for May, we are very pleased to have with us Dr. Rick Grant. You probably hopefully all see that wonderful picture. I'm the better looking one on the right in case there's any confusion up there at this point. Uh, Rick uh, grew up actually on a dairy farm in upstate New York and uh, got his BS degree from uh, Cornell. And then went over and got his PhD at Purdue under uh, Jack Albright. And many of us will recognize that name as well in 1988. He then went on to a postdoc at the uh, Forge Research Center at Madison, Wisconsin, USDA, and then moved on to Nebraska. So it looked like he was working his way from east to west at this point and was professor at Extension Dairy Specialist from 1990 to 2003. Uh, currently, Rick is uh, president of the Minard Agriculture Research Institute at Chasey, New York. They do a lot of research there in the area of dairy nutrition, forage quality, cattle management. They do some teaching with Cornell and also with uh, uh, Vermont, and I believe they have an arrangement also with a sister school in Japan. So, uh, Rick or Dr. Grant, we certainly welcome you to our seminar, uh, webinar, I should say, and we'll turn it over to you to uh, uh, discuss uh, managing cow behavior for profit and performance. Rick, welcome. Well, thank you, Mike, for that introduction. Um, pleasure to be here this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are, I suppose. Um, relative to the pictures, Mike, I just have to say that my first um, decision as president of Minor Institute was to outlaw ties. So I'm at a disadvantage compared to you relative to photographs. I understand. I understand. So let's, let's go ahead and get started then, if we can. Um, I think I might need to double click on this based on information. There we go. Okay, well, the title slide, basically what I want to talk about this, uh, this afternoon is taking advantage of what we know to be true about cow behavior and using that to our advantage to improve profitability and performance of our herds. So with that, we will jump into the discussion. This first slide shows what I consider what I call the big picture. Not very creative, but for me, it really does give the overview of this whole area. And really, you can look at this slide for me as, as the roadmap to this afternoon's talk. If we look at the environment, the management environment that the cow finds herself in, it really is comprised of two components. There's the physical aspect as well as the social aspect. And, and many times we think, first of all, about the physical component of her environment and kind of stop there. We think about things we can measure, like stall, stall dimensions, bunk space, uh, flooring, ventilation. Uh, as we look to summer, we think about the temperature humidity index and things of that nature. What I'm going to focus on even more this afternoon, though, is the social environment. And I, I will specifically focus on recent data in terms of grouping strategies and stocking density and how those two interact and really how they influence the competition that any individual cow will experience within a pen. But certainly the physical and social environment, they do interact. And by and large, I guess my basic feeling is that they determine that cow's ability to practice normal time budgeting and her whole repertoire of natural behaviors. And I'm going to focus in the interest of time on resting, feeding, and ruminating this afternoon, but certainly there's good evidence in the scientific literature that those three behaviors, if our housing and our management routines get it right, that's when we're going to have the maximum productivity and health of our herds, and of course, we all know that translates into the greatest profitability. So let's start with a photograph here as we sort of ease into the topic. Hopefully you can all see this picture. And, and the question I'm asking is, will this management environment affect response to the diet, no matter how well formulated it is? And I think you can all see pretty clearly that this is a gross example of overcrowding. Okay. You can see, so let's imagine, if you can, that you're this cow standing right here in the front of the picture. 
Now, again, no matter how well formulated that diet is over here, where we can envision perhaps the feed manger, how easy is it going to be for this cow to approach the feed in that manger? Or think about the stall, the other major resource in that pen. How easy or difficult will it be for that cow to enter into this comfortable stall? And I suppose there's waters in that pen somewhere if you could see them. And again, how easily, how easily accessible are these waters? And think about ventilation. We see fans in this picture in the month of July and August. If this is in a warm part of the country, how will this overcrowding affect ventilation capabilities in that barn? So overall here, we're talking about the interaction of management with diet. We tend to focus a lot on diet, but we cannot forget the importance of management. And to that point, one of the best studies I've seen in a long while was published two years ago in the Journal of Dairy Science. And it specifically focused on the interaction of management environment and herd performance. And it had a very unique setup in that there were 47 dairy herds. And they were selected so that they all had similar genetics. And here's the important part. They were all fed the same exact TMR. So you see what the authors were trying to do is they were trying to remove genetics as much as possible and absolutely remove the effect of nutrition on the variation from herd to herd in milk production. And if we looked at this data set then, the average milk production across all those dairies was about 65 pounds of milk. But here's the important part. Look at the variability, plus or minus 29 pounds per day. And the way to look at that, that is really management. Around that mean of 65 pounds across those 47 dairies, whether it was 29 pounds greater or less, that reflected the management environment of those cows on that farm. So this is a good quantitative way to think about it. And in fact, when they did their analysis, they found that these non-dietary or management factors accounted for 56% of the variation in milk yield. So we all think that nutrition is important, and it really it is. But as you might guess, your gut probably tells you that management can account for at least that amount of the variability, if not more. And in fact, the three major factors that they identified were feeding for refusals at any level. On average, those herds <clears throat> had greater milk production than those herds which did not practice feeding for refusals, and also feeding for push-ups. And again, and this is unfortunate, but in this study, they didn't really delve into that in any great detail. But look at this tremendous effect of feeding for push-ups versus not. It gets back to feed accessibility, but they averaged 55 pounds per day versus nearly 64 pounds for those herds that had routine feed push-up strategy. And of course, you can pick your own price of milk, but there's definitely economics that go along with that. And then the final factor, which they found to be extremely important as a component of the management environment, was stalls per cow. And the next slide actually contains a data set right from that paper, and we'll jump into stocking density toward the end of this talk. But let's think about it right here up front. This slide shows the relationship between stalls per cow along here at the bottom and milk yield. And I apologize for it being kilos per day, but hopefully we can get past that. And you can see there's a lot of variation across that range of stalls per cow, as we might expect. But certainly there's a clear positive relationship. And in fact, if you look at the best fit line through that data, and look at this R square, which is it's just simply a way of, of saying that about a third, about 32% of the variability in milk yield across these 47 dairies was explained just by stalls per cow. And to me, that's pretty incredible that one factor, stall stocking density in this case, can explain that much of the variation. I want to make one more point here, and maybe this is, I might be carrying this a little bit too far, but I don't think so. If we look at the, the right side of this figure, and we look at the highest stalls per cow, or in other words, the lowest stocking rate, so there's more stall availability per cow, we see there are quite a few high producing herds, but we also see that there's a fair number of lower producing herds too. And so that lesson there would certainly be that, you know, high stall availability doesn't necessarily guarantee high milk yield, just like high forage quality doesn't guarantee high milk yield. But I think the opposite is true. If you look at that red circle I've drawn on there, these are some of the higher stocking densities, the least amount of stall availability per cow. And we see very clearly there's no herds that had very, very low stall availability and also were able to maintain high milk yield. So I think those two might be mutually exclusive. We need more data, but boy, we know just from practical experience 
in addition to the research that it's hard to have high production when you get to a certain level of stocking density on a stall basis. And I'll come back to that toward the end of the, of the talk. But that 0.8 stalls per cow, just as a benchmark, equates to roughly about 120% stall stocking density. So keep that number in mind as we move through the talk. So with that as a backdrop, that tremendous importance of the, the, the management environment, that plus or minus 29 pounds, not due to nutrition, let's talk about time budgeting, all right? And here what I've tried to show, I, hopefully everyone's seen this before. I just want to make a couple of major points relative to the typical time budget of dairy cows. And of course, this would be in a freestall environment. First of all, if we look at the top, we see the two major activities that the cow engages in every day would be eating and lying down. As I look at this, I always have to chuckle because it's not much different than my teenage son. The only difference is cows might actually be productive. So five. <laughs> I thought I might hear you chuckle there. Um, five hours per day eating, 12 to 14 hours per day resting. If you add those together, 70% of that cow's day is spent eating and resting. We have to have housing and we have to have management to get that right. If we don't, nothing else really matters, does it? Then we can flip through the rest of this pretty quickly. All the other things that make a cow a cow, you add it up and you get about 20 to 21 and a half hours, maybe 22 hours per day total that the cow needs to accomplish all of her things which make her a cow. All right, 24 hours a day, we can't change that. Unfortunately, there's 24 hours in a day. So the simple math would tell us that really there's only about two and a half to three and a half hours per day which are available for what I call milking, but really what I mean there is time spent outside the pen away from feed, water, and stalls, okay? That's the crux, that's the important part of time budgeting and every producer, every consultant ought to know this number that's in the square box right, or in the black box. Two and a half to three and a half hours a day on average total time spent away from the pen. Now just to add one more nuance to this, in a paper that was published just actually I think it was uh, in the last issue, the December issue of the Journal of Dairy Science by the Wisconsin Vet Group, they, they took a look at time budgeting and they were able to fine-tune this two and a half to three and a half hours a day. They looked at a number of cows across several dairies and they found that herds which had sand stalls or comfortable stalls and relatively healthy cows relative to lameness status, so no high amounts of lame cows, actually they could afford to be outside the pen for as much as four to four and a half hours a day. All right. On the other hand, if you happen to be a herd or manager or consult with a herd, that has less comfortable stalls or, or mattresses, for instance, which aren't well maintained, and you have higher incidence of lame cows, two and a half hours per day may be too much. This number may be as little as one to one and a half hours a day. And that really is a significant management challenge for some of our dairies. So the point is, there's a certain amount of time that the cow can afford to be away from the feed, water, and stalls. That's got to impact how we design our facilities and manage the cows and it's going to be variable depending on the health status of the herd and the level of comfort of the stall. That is the key point. That's the whole ball of wax relative to time budgeting. So common ways that we can disturb the time budget or another way to look at that might be simply increasing the cost of production on farm. You can see there's a whole laundry list here on this slide and certainly I'm not going to bore you by going through each one I'll come back to some of the key ones as we go through the talk this afternoon. But uh, certainly one I won't come back to, but I feel like I need to mention it, especially for our fresh cows, is routinely locking cows in headlocks for more than an hour per day. The data is pretty clear in my mind from a time budgeting standpoint that if we routinely lock in cows and think fresh cows for more than an hour a day, we are asking that cow to give up something during that day that she should be doing, even if fresh feed is in front of her. Because basically within an hour, she's done eating and she'd be better off lying down and ruminating in a stall. All right. I'm not going to get into the whole short pen stays during transition, but the Wisconsin Vet Group has done a tremendous job defining and explaining the potential implications on the farm of the social turmoil associated with two quick transitions from one pen to another, from far off to close up, maternity, fresh. We need to avoid those sort of things. I'm going to say a little bit more as we go through about stalls and feed availability. And of course, especially sitting here in northern New York, 
it's hard for me to imagine that heat stress is coming, but sooner or later, later it will come. And inadequate heat stress abatement is a great way to keep your cows standing too long and to really mess up their time budget. So one point I'd like to make, farmers often will say, all right, the concept of time budgeting is pretty straightforward. Makes sense. But do they really matter? In a dollars and cents manner, do I really need to worry about time budgeting? And this slide shows the best data set I'm aware of relative to the fundamental importance of time budgeting. This was some work that we did actually when I was still in Nebraska with one of my last grad students there named Bill Matsky. And we were able to manipulate on farm the amount of time that the cow spent outside the pen between either three hours a day, which would be good, versus six hours a day, which based on my time budgeting slide, you'd realize is totally inadequate for time budgeting. So three versus six hours a day. We did this by adjusting pen size versus parlor capacity. So we inserted gates in the pen to either have smaller, more, more smaller pens or one larger pen. And we had mixed premium multi pairs cows, first calf heifers, older cows together at 100% stocking. So in this study, stocking density is not even an issue. Well, as we compare three versus six hours a day outside the pen, look at this tremendous cow response. The older cows gained two and a half hours per day rest, and over 14 days, that was associated with about a five pound per day increase in milk production. Now look at these first calf heifers that we had competing in these pens in this study. The first calf heifers gained 4.1 hours per day rest. That is just phenomenal. They were being shortchanged by four hours a day. And again, over two, two weeks, that resulted acutely in eight pounds per day more milk. And we know nothing at this point of what happened long term. The point is, and there's more data we could show if we had time, but there's a true biological link between time spent in the pen, in other words, access to stalls, how long an animal will lie down. And we know that first calf peppers are almost always going to be less competitive, hence the four hours a day increase in resting. And we know finally and importantly that there's a true link between incremental increases in resting time and milk production. And again, just as I indicated at the bottom, put in your own numbers, but there's clearly, clearly a significant economic impact of time budgeting on our dairies. One more thing I want to say is I, before I leave the time budgeting point is there are many natural behavioral differences between first calf heifers and older cows. So naturally, there's going to be some significant differences in their time budgeting requirements and how they respond to a given management environment. They take smaller bites. They eat more slowly. They're smaller. We know they're less dominant. Um, they're more easily displaced. Study after study shows that, whether it's the stalls or the manger, they're easily displaced. And something I won't have time to get into later, so I'll say it now, heifers avoid stalls that are previously occupied by dominant cows. And this is interesting. For the farmers in the audience, I'm sure they've noticed this, that there are preferred stalls in a pen. And when heifers have to use a stall that they know is preferred by the dominant cows in that pen, they ruminate less. And that's interesting. We need to follow up on what the long-term implications of that would be. So typically, those would be the stalls that are nearest the feed. If you, if you have overstocking or just poor barn design and you see heifers routinely having to lie in these stalls, where they're more likely to be displaced, what is the effect of this long-term reduction in rumination? It could explain some of the problems we see relative to competitiveness and productivity of heifers in commingled or mixed pens. And in fact, that effect is summarized on the next slide here. We have the effect of competition with older cows on first calf heifers. And this is all data under environments where they're essentially under 100% stocking density conditions. So again, this is the competitiveness or the performance of heifers with older cows in the absence of overcrowding. The original data back in 1980s, or the classic data, showed that intake, resting time, and milk production are all reduced by 10 to 20% when we force heifers to compete with older cows. More recent data would show greater loss of body weight and reduced efficiency of fat-corrected milk production within that all-important 30 days in milk and the same group in an abstract a few years ago reported that the heifers have less drinking time, lower rumination activity, and lower milk fat percent when they're competing with older cows. So you put it all together, I guess the point I'm, I try to make with producers is that 
even in the absence of, of over, overcrowding. Let's not kid ourselves. I suspect in a lot of cases we probably are leaving money on the table when we commingle cows by parity, first calf and older cows. I know in a lot of cases there's not much we can do about it, um, but it, we need to understand potential lost profit involved with commingling these animals within a pen. And there's one more thing. Now, if we layer stocking density on top of that, here's some work we did at the Institute a few years ago. We looked at 100 up to 142% stocking rate, and this was in a four-row barn. So this is stocking rate based on stalls as well as headlocks. This is the difference in milk production, multi-pairs versus primipares cows in pounds per day. So for instance, at 100% stocking rate, this would say the multi-pairs cows, the older cows, produced about six pounds per day more than the primipares cows, if you can follow that. And so as we incrementally increase stocking density, then we can see that goes up to 13.8, 21 pounds, and then back down to 15. The point here is that just a very small increase in stocking density, going from 100 to 113 percent, is all that it takes to put those first calf peppers at a profound disadvantage relative to the multiparous cow. Six up to 14 pounds per day advantage of the older cows. And that goes up even more as we hit 130. And then at 142%, they come back together, which means now that the heifers have figured it out, it means that at that point, even the older cows are getting hammered. And pardon my scientific terminology there. And these changes in milk production reflect losses in resting and rumination activity. And again, just like some of the other things I've talked about, there's real dollars and cents associated with the keeping first calf heifers and older cows together, and even more importantly, overstocking them when you've done so. So here's a question for you to think about, and I believe this brings us up to the first poll. Really, really, this is a quiz, I guess. Which is more important, if you're the cow, eating or resting? I've talked about both. And so here's, I guess here's the poll question. I'm going to turn over the how this actually operates to people who are more technologically savvy than me. But it's pretty simple. Eating, resting, or do you think the research would say that both are equally important? More for resting for us. <laughs> Hopefully no one's engaged in excessive resting activity right now. So I, am, I do realize this is either over the noon hour or it's actually right after lunch, depending on where you are across the country. So, so they should be voting now. Is that right, Jim? Uh, at this point, we should be voting, and so far... Uh, we, we have 67%. I don't see... Oh. Apparently the <coughs> organizers aren't able to vote. Is that right? That is correct. Um, yeah. What is? That's Come on, not, I'm from Illinois. I like to vote early and well, vote often. I'd, uh, I've seen the PowerPoints, and so I knew the answer. And uh, I was, I, I don't, I'm not uh, right very often, but when I have a chance to be right, I thought I'd take advantage of it. But apparently, I can't vote. I, I was going to vote for resting, but then that tipped my hand, and I don't have the PowerPoints. Yeah. I, I couldn't be wrong here as far as that well, goes. Probably just as well as you, you can't vote, Mike, because then you won't muddy the waters a little bit. <laughs> What percent are we at now, Jim? We're at 88% here. Yeah, that's so. great. We appreciate you, your, you folks uh, participating in this. This is great. Okay. I'm Let's close to... them. Let's close them. This is Illinois. Right, Let's right. close these polls. We're going to lose. Look at that. Wow. Oh. Hmm. Well. <laughs> so, should I, right I should flip to the next slide now to get to the results so everybody can see them? Or? <laughs> yes. Yes, go ahead. So far, we're not flipping, we're, are we? Well, maybe the Jim needs to do that. I don't know how that works. I'll let Jim do it. Oh, there okay, we wait. There, there's the results. To... Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Okay. Which is more important? So it's pretty close. People, no, no one thought that eating is important. And maybe people have heard me speak or they've read this before. And then it's about 50 50. 52% thought resting, 48% thought both are equally important which would seem to be the easy answer, right? But in fact, every study done, and I'll flip to the next slide because that actually explains it, every study done to date would show that cows have a strong behavioral need to rest, and they will in fact sacrifice feeding to make up lost resting time. And that's a key point relative to behavioral management of the cow. Of course, both are important, but if you ask the cow to choose, if you put her in a situation where she has to recoup lost resting time, and it could be due to poor time budgeting, it could be due to poor stall design, it could be due to a lot of things. She is going to walk by 
a full bunk, and she may even be hungry, but she's going to make up that lost resting time. And in fact, data is pretty clear too that cows spend more time waiting in alleys to lie down than eating when overstocked. And that's probably one of the reasons why we see drop offs in performance when cows are chronically overstocked. So that, that's, that's probably one of the first points that we can make relative to time budgeting. I like to call it vitamin R. It's not that uh, novel anymore, but certainly there is a requirement, and most people would say it's about 12 hours per day. So relative to resting time, is there a relationship between resting time and milk yield? Depends on the studies. Here's a data set that we have developed over time at the Institute. And you can see, just like that other diagram I showed you earlier on, which showed um, stall stocking density versus milk yield, we see there's a lot of variability, but certainly there is a positive relationship between resting time and milk yield. And in fact, the slope of this line would say that for every extra hour of resting time you can get into that cow, you might expect to see about three and a half or 3.7 pounds more milk for each extra hour. And the swag that I've applied to this over time, going back to some of the earlier data sets, is that if you can do something on your dairy to improve the comfort of the resting surface or the access to that stall, if you can get an extra hour into your cows, you might expect anywhere between two to three and a half pounds more milk per cow per day. And that's acutely, that, that's relatively soon within a, within a week or two. And that's really not saying anything about the longer term consequences relative to lameness and overall health and reproduction and so forth. So I think these are two important biological concepts we need to keep in mind. The relationship between resting time and milk yield and then the associated response between stalls per cow and milk yield. Okay. Just to drive this home, this is some recent data, I guess it's two years, two years old now, but looked at stall surface resting and milk yield. And my point in showing this uh, figure isn't to get into a detailed discussion about sand, which in this case would be the yellow line, versus alternative beds such as chop straw, rubber mats, or mattress. I, we could talk about that endlessly. And people will say, well, you could change the mattress system and get different responses in milk yield over time. My point is, as we look at this data set over the eight weeks of the study, you can see the cows on the sand stalls held milk production. Cows and the other three alternatives dropped off. Here's the point. In the last three weeks, when the actual milk response was statistically significant, the cows lost about 11.6 pounds per day relative to sand. At the same time, they lost about 3.2 hours per day resting time. And if you take that thumb rule I just showed you and multiply it times 3.2 hours per day, to me it's incredible. You would have predicted 11.8 pounds per day loss, and it's very close to what they actually measured. And, and there's any number of data sets out there which show the same thing, so it's real. Oftentimes, I think people don't really buy into the fact that there's a relationship between resting and milk, but there certainly is. It's real, and the cows will tell us that. Just one more quick slide just to bring up. So I've talked about milk production, but there is, over time, there's the long-term consequences of not enough rest, too much standing. And here's just one piece of data. This is from Minnesota workers looking at the prevalence of lameness in high-producing cows. They used 53 high-production pens on 50 dairy farms. And what they found is that greater lameness prevalence, the factor that was most highly associated with that was more time spent outside the pen. Time budgeting. So I can say along with milk production, poor time budgeting due to facilities or management is also the most highly associated factor with lameness incidents on a dairy. And that to me is pretty incredible. So I'm going to quickly move to just a few points about feeding and, and, and the, what's the natural feeding behaviors of cows and how can we take advantage of that. Um, this is going to be old data from 1999 now, but boy, it's still interesting. Cows willingly exert over 500 pounds of pressure against the feed barrier while eating. And to put it into perspective, the same research group found that about 225 pounds of, of pressure or force was enough to cause tissue damage or bruising. So cows will exert about twice as much pressure as it takes uh, to injure themselves, right, in an effort to eat. I can't think of a better functional definition of aggressive feeding drive. Uh, as hungry as I've been, I've never, ever hurt myself eating. I felt sick afterwards sometimes. I've never hurt myself eating, but cows will do that if we poorly manage their facility or how we manage them within that facility. And I think this would be important for both Thai as well as free stalls. You see this picture here. This is actually a herd that we worked with when I was back in Nebraska. And you can see this is about a four-inch metal pipe. And that bend in there probably shouldn't be there, right? And it's a, again, it's illustrative of the pressure cows will exert when they're trying to eat feed. And as managers, 
or as consultants, we have to make sure that we manage the availability of that feed so the cows don't have to experience that because if they do routinely, the data is pretty clear that you're going to actually take this aggressive feeding drive, you're going to train the cows to become less aggressive feeders, which we don't want. So what stimulates aggressive feeding behavior? <clears throat> there are three, feed accessibility and periods of empty bunk, feed push-up strategy, and then the big one is frequency of feeding or delivery of fresh TMR. And some great uh, Canadian work has found that how many times a day TMR is mixed and delivered really is the biggest driver, the most important driver of feeding behavior. And what's kind of, I don't have time to get into it today, but what's neat from a producer standpoint that it looks to me like about two times per day is optimal. There's definitely an advantage of, of mixing and delivering feed twice a day versus once a day, but going beyond that doesn't necessarily give you the benefits that you might expect. So if you're a farmer and you're out there thinking, I can feed twice a day, but if I could feed three or four, I might be better, I don't think that's the case. Stop it twice a day. Ways to increase dry matter intake by one pound. And of course, there's a little bit of swag here, but in a review paper that Jack Albright and I did several years ago, there is data behind all of these. One is smooth manger surface, and you could also uh, wrap into that the, the, the manger height. It certainly is a way to improve dry matter intake. And there was a great little article in one of the, I think it was the February, one of the February issues of Port Dairyman, where someone talked about ways to quickly redo a, a pitted or poor manger surface with ceramic tile. Great idea. Accessibility of feed to cows. We talk about feed push-up strategy, feed availability throughout the day. We need to have at least 21 hours a day uh, of feed accessibility if we hope to optimize dry matter intake. Bunk space, you know, we know the story for lactating cows, probably two feet at least. For the uh, transition cow close up or fresh, no less than 30 inches. There's not a lot of data there, but I think field experience would tell us we need all of this 30 inches, as well as adequate access to stalls. And then there's a little bit of data on alley width behind the feed manger. The alley the cow stands in has to be 14 feet in order to optimize feed intake. That allows for undisturbed feeding and two-way traffic behind the cow. All right. So we get to stocking density, behavioral responses, and this leads us maybe to a true poll. And I guess it's a simple question. What stocking density do you typically run in your high cow pen as a percent of free stalls? Or if you're a consultant, I guess maybe what's, what's typical? What do you typically see for stocking density on a stall basis for the high production pen? So I guess at this point, um, Jim, you can open up the polls and we'll see what, what we have out here in the audience. Okay, polls are open. All right. Wow. <clears throat> and to me, this is going to be really interesting because over the last year or so, as I've given this similar talk around the country, I'm amazed at what appears to be sort of the baseline uh, stocking density that people would consider to be sort of normal operating, uh, you know, sort of the standard operating procedures on their dairies. Well, I think it's all over but the shouting, Rick, because I think I got 100% or 95% uh, adding up, and I look at look look at at the numbers at this point, Jim. Do no, you the totals at the bottom, 67 percent. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I was looking at the other one. How could I get 100 percent? But we won't go there. We won't <laughs> go there at this stage of the game. There well, really is something screwy about Illinois, huh? Careful, careful. Uh, all the time I thought it was just an urban legend. No, no. Our governor is being tried as we speak today, so he's he's defending himself. To see, we sent another governor to prison or not? So we got one in, and the second one Rick? on his way. Yeah, Rick at the Horse Dairyman Farm. All of, just about all of our pens are right at well between 100 and 110 percent. But we do have uh, pen one, which is mostly first calf heifers uh, of our, you know, Guernseys now, and then uh, uh, Jerseys that have just been fresh. Uh, uh, maybe 10 to 10 days to two weeks. Uh, there we're at about 127 uh, percent. And based on what you've been saying uh, the, today, uh, maybe we should revisit that uh, in that uh, pen of uh, heifers and fresh jerseys. Oh, definitely. You know, again, I don't, I don't have time to go into all that d data, but we know pretty clearly that you don't want to overstock those sort of pens, right? And probably. Mm -hmm. Something like 80% might be closer to uh, optimal for those sort of pens, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100% is probably overstocked. Really? Yep. Yep. Well, yeah, there's interesting results. <clears throat> okay. So we got about 76% voted, is what I see. Um, right. Yeah. I closed the poll and we um, are showing the results now. 
All right, let me pull it up so I can see that. So, okay, so everybody can see this now. Um, this actually isn't too far off from what I've been I've been hearing when I when I'm speaking face to face. Uh, majority is still 100 to 110 percent, and I hear a lot of people probably closer to 110 percent than not. But there's a fairly good number, and actually I think it might have been higher in some of my informal polling that actually is above 110 percent, closer to 120. Um, the less than 100% is interesting for the high-producing cows. It'd be interesting to find out why that is. Um, and then there's a contingent that goes up to quite high levels. No one's over 140 in this group, which is interesting. Normally, there's at least one person. Um, and, it, and it could be just the makeup of farmers versus consultants and so forth in this audience. But, um, but that is a backdrop, though. So this is the real world. This is a snapshot of people listening. I want to next just give you a quick overview of what we know about the effects of overcrowding on time budgeting and productive response of the cows. So start with feeding behavior. <clears throat> There's great uh, scientific evidence for all of these effects of stocking density at the manger on greater aggression and, and displacements getting kicked out of the bunk. Time of eating can be shifted and, and you can have more unnatural, undesirable feeding behavior such as fewer meals, <clears throat> greater feeding rates, slug feeding in other words. And oftentimes the effect is greatest for the subordinate cow. But within limits, you know, the cow can adjust her feeding behavior in response to higher stocking rates. She cannot do that, though, with resting time. A cow can't rest faster, right? So that, I think that's another reason why, just basically, resting time is a little bit more important to the cow than feeding. The next slide does summarize <clears throat> what I've been able to find from the eight studies published in the literature with the effect of stocking density versus the relative response and rest. And the way I set this up is, <clears throat> Whatever the response was at 100% stocking of the stalls, I called that one. And so in any study, if the number at a particular stocking density was not different than 100%, I gave it a one. So this would say under 100% stocking, there's no benefit. Basically, there's no difference in resting response, which is pretty understandable. But as you go above 100% stocking of the stalls, up to about 150 or more, which is what we've seen across the studies, and is pretty typical of the real world, there's a lot of variation there, isn't there, from study to study? Like there's a lot of variation from farm to farm. But if you have time to really study this out, one thing becomes clear over time. Around 120%, that would appear to be some sort of a critical level. Because of beyond that, in every study, there is a significant drop off in resting time. And so I'm not saying 120% is optimal. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying across a lot of situations, I'm willing to say that 120% stocking rate is probably a critical number beyond which you would expect things to start going south in some manner. And it's probably going to depend on your management uh, abilities and the type of facility you have, but you don't want to go beyond that point if you're really hoping to optimize not only the well-being but also the performance and profitability of your dairy. So as we overstock, cows aren't resting as much. What are they doing? Well, here's, again, some work we did looking at cows resting from midnight to 4 a.m., same incremental increase in stocking density as I mentioned before, we can see that the percent of cows resting did drop off, particularly above 113%. Feeding time went up a little bit, but that was far from being significant. Of course, the big thing they're doing is standing in the alley, wasting their time. To me, that is this picture right here, if you can see it well, this is the best working definition of cows wasting their time. It's a still from some video at 142% stocking density, 1 a.m. In our herd, every cow should be in a, in a stall at 1 a.m., you can see here there's one, two, three cows waiting for a stall to open up. Not a good thing if you're trying to manage cows for health and productivity. Haven't said much about rumination, but certainly overcrowding will reduce rumination. We all know the importance of cud chewing and saliva production and buffering. But just as a quick aside, these mixed parity groups I talked about before, they reduce rumination. Excessive headlock time reduces rumination. And again, with an eye toward the future this summer, heat stress reduces rumination. So we can't forget, that's my one rumination slide. I feel a little bit of guilt only having one, but I'll live with it. But it is important. All right. One thing relative to stocking density, we need more data on this because it takes a lot of observations to approach significance with this. But here's some work. We've pulled a lot of data that we've done at the Institute relative to stocking density. What is the effect on mastitis? Well, here this shows clinical mastitis events per 305-day lactation. And over here on the right, let's start here. This is what we've seen at 100% stocking density of stalls and headlocks versus 142%. You can see there is a huge increase in the 
clinical mastitis events, which maybe makes sense. But to put it into perspective here, if you go through the published literature, what's normal, both on the low and the high side, would be right around here. You can see that our 100% stocking density treatment falls right in there in terms of clinical events per lactation. But look at how much the stocking density of 142% jacks that up. It's well outside the normal range. And in fact, this red bar is what's been reported in terms of clinical events for a coliform outbreak. So what this basically says is that overcrowding at 142% of stalls gives you overall a situation for mastitis which is worse, far worse, than having chronic coliform problems. For most farmers, I think that would put it into just the right perspective. One other thing I want to point out is, is the relationship between stocking and reproduction. We don't talk about this enough, even though this has been out there for several years now. This is some Wisconsin work, which looked at data from 150 plus farms. And their basic question was, what are the factors which are most highly related to pregnancy, to conception? And what they found, that one, one that popped right to the top, was bunk space in the breeding pen. And what they found, the relationship was, is bunk space in the breeding pen decreased from two feet down to 12 inches, the percent of cows pregnant by 150 days milk dropped in half, 70 down to 35%. That is, to me, just, I just, it's amazing. I can't really find the words for it. And people look at this and they might say, well, geez, how common is 12 inches of bunk space in a, in a pen? But I will say, you know, if you've got a three-row pen, a six-row barn, and you're at 100% stocking rate, already you're down to 16 to 18 inches, depending on how the barn's built. You don't have to creep up stocking rate at the stalls very much, and pretty soon you're in this 12 to 14 inches, aren't you? So I wonder, I wonder, this is a question I'll leave with you. We're talking about preg rates, and, and we know pregnancy, getting cows pregnant is a big challenge for almost all of our dairies. Is stocking density in the breeding pen an overlooked contributor? I'd encourage you to come back and take a look at that if you haven't. And certainly there's real value associated with pregnancies on our farm. All right? So there's, of course, a lot of data on overcrowding, which I don't have time for today. But I've tried to summarize in this slide. So changes in these basic behaviors relative to feeding and aggressive feeding, feeding rate, wasting time in the alleys, depressed rumination, understanding that the effect is worse for the subordinate or the, the least competitive cow in the group. All these behavioral changes can result in these economic losses under some conditions. And it would involve lower production, maybe lower milk fat, greater somatic cell count, more health disorders, fewer pregnancies. Um, there's data on all of those. It doesn't happen in every case, but certainly it does happen in a lot of cases. So what is the effect on cost of production of overcrowding? I would argue it could be pretty substantial. What's optimal? Well, we, we alluded to, or, or um, Steve mentioned, you know, the, the transition cows, understock those. That's a whole story in and of itself, but certainly we need to be concerned about the bunk space availability. And it's also a function of stall availability, I'm convinced. For lactating cows in a four-row barn, I'd say don't exceed this 115 to 120%. But if you're commingling cows and heifers, I would say don't go over 100 based on that one data slide. It doesn't take much of an increase over 100% to put those heifers at a severe competitive disadvantage. Six row barns, not much data there, but I guess just to be conservative, if you don't go over 100% stocking rate on a stall basis, you should ensure adequate uh, feed availability. But the bottom line, thinking about the cow's perspective, no matter what the, uh, the, the, the housing type, no matter what the stocking density, you have to manage those cows to ensure 24-7 access to feed, water, and stalls. That's the bottom line from the cow's perspective. And one more point about this, remember the physical and the social environments interact, don't they? We spend a lot of time over here talking about overcrowding. And for instance, that causes all of these, this whole host of changes, undesirable changes in behavior, less rumination, more sorting, increased feeding rate, greater standing. Coming down the road in the next month or so, heat stress. They are going to amplify each other because they cause very similar negative impacts on behavior. So the net effect on subacute acidosis, no fat depression or lameness is just going to be amplified if we don't think about both the social as well as the physical components of the cow's environment. And finally, I'm going to take just the last minute. And, and Mike, I think I'm, my clock says I've got a couple more minutes here in terms of actual 45 minute time. Is that about right? Um, yep, I've been, you're, I've, yeah, you're in good shape. Really, okay. in good shape. I've been talking about cow behavior, and I've, I've been feeling like I'm duty-bound the last year or so to throw in this last two or three slides. 
talk about cow behavior, what about our behavior? Especially when you think about cost of production, adjusting our attitudes and, and asking yourself the basic question, are you a source of comfort or stress for your cows? You know, we all have seen this data before, I suspect, the effect of fear on residual milk production. So this is residual milk. Um, you can see that with, with gentle handling versus aversive, and that's just a fancy word for rough handling in the parlor. You can see there's much more residual milk when cows are handled roughly in the parlor. We know that. We know it. We, we can see it if we're not careful. More recently, this is a paper published last year in Journal of Dairy Science, which, which caught my attention. They're talking about empathy. I don't want, don't want to get all, you know, touchy-feely and, and, and warm and fuzzy with you, but I feel like I have to point this out. They had this, this standardized tool that where people or farmers could look at pictures of cows uh, undergoing varying procedures or situations which caused pain. And the farmer was asked to sort of rate their empathy with how much pain the animal was feeling with the different conditions. And then they split them into high empathy or low empathy, right? <laughs> look at this at difference in milk production on average throughout the year between those farmers who indicated they were more empathetic, more sympathetic, I guess, if you will, with the cow's experience of pain versus those who were a little rough. Um, basically, 2,000 pounds per cow per year. That's incredible. Now, I think probably something else is going on in this study. I can't believe that empathy level of the farmer explains that much. But it's food for thought, isn't it? And it kind of builds on that previous slide. And then finally, maybe more classically, we know that cows give more milk with gentle versus aversive handling. A little more recently than that, cows give 3.5% or more milk. When the milking team had greater positive vocal as well as physical contact with the cow, so it's not just physical contact, it's, it's vocalization, it's, it's, it's a tone of voice that you use. And I throw this in here, not because it's something maybe you haven't heard or thought about, but I know it's not always in the front of my mind, and we start talking about facilities and things which cost money, the beauty of this is it says right here it doesn't cost a dime to be in a good at it, a good um, frame of mind versus a, a lousy frame of mind. It doesn't cost a dime, and certainly it's related to greater performance of your cows. So I think with that, the bottom line for me is that going back to the very first set of slides I showed you today, curds with similar genetics fed the same TMR had a huge variation in milk production from herd to herd to herd, plus or minus 29 pounds a day. That's a very good quantitative definition of management, the management environment. And so we know that if we successfully manage the physical and social components of that cow's environment, we're going to improve her ability to optimize her time budgeting behaviors, improve her comfort, to use that overall term, her health, performance, and you would expect at the end of the day the profitability of that dairy. So to me it boils down to, say, listening to your cows, now this, this slide here, you know, let them they have to lie down. Resting is key. Beha uh, feeding behavior is important, but the cows will prioritize rest. And this is the only way that you can have a true low cost of production, right? By really thinking about and trying to optimize the management of the dairy so that if you, when you think about this variability, hopefully your herd is in the plus side, on the plus side of that mean. So I think, Mike, with that, I will stop and turn the program over to you and we'll move to the next phase. Well, very good, uh, Dr. Grant. That was just fantastic. You must have been practicing. You you are the first person that actually hit the 45-minute magic timeline. So, our congratulations I'll tell to you. you. My, I, my personality type is obsessive-compulsive. If you said 46, <laughs> I would have been at 46. I'm Ooh, joking. Wow, we, I'm we have to have, have him back. <laughs> I'll tell you, we'll have to put him down for another. We do have questions. We have several here in our offices as well at this stage of the game. So I guess I will go ahead and read those questions uh, to our listeners so they can hear them come in. Uh, one had to do, a very interesting one, uh, Dr. Grant. Would it make more sense grouping cows by behavior or temperament? For example, putting aggressives in one pen and the slow walkers in another pen, and then by staging, uh, by late stage of lactation, especially say we had several mature cow groups uh, at that point, assuming with they, they have about the same nutrient requirement. Your thoughts? Yeah, well, that's, that's a good general question. And in fact, I guess uh, underlying all of my presentation, that, that's part of it. I think you, you can't entirely move away from grouping cows based on some performance measure, right, or, or days in days milk or something like that. But to me, the classic one is um, first calf heifers, recognizing their differences in behavioral characteristics or typically their competitiveness. Um, putting them in a separate pen, at least for the first part of lactation, to me is almost a no-brainer. 
because then you can feed them more appropriately, but also you can take advantage of the fact that they're not going to be as comfortable with their environment. They're growing, and so they're slowly increasing in sort of their, their uh, competitiveness and their level in the social hierarchy. You, you've got to take advantage of both, but I would say separating cows from heifers is a good one. Understocking the transition pens is another way to work into or, or to, to acknowledge the importance of how aggressive the cows can be, how competitive they can be, right? So you understock, and that way, even if you have heifers and cows together, chances are that heifer will still have ample access to the feed and to the stall. Does that make sense to you, Mike? Yep, sure does. Okay. Rick, can you, can you move to the next PowerPoint? Uh, I think that's a signal to our um, listeners that we are in the Q&A session here. And also, oh, um, yes, I apologize. Also prompts me, uh, by the way, to indicate uh, that uh, June 13th, uh, June 13th will be our next webinar, and uh, you'll see more of that in Horns Dairyman Magazine. That's going to be Dr. Lance Bumgart from Iowa State University. Lance will be discussing the impact of heat stress and his role in nutrition management. A great topic at a great time of the year. So put that down in your day planner. Uh, June 13th, uh, same time, same location. Hopefully, we'll have most of you back. We've had a very good turnout on this one as well. And of course, we want to welcome your questions they are coming in now more aggressively here and again we do want to recognize uh, Marielle for their, their their continued support over the time and I know Steve will wrap up here just a little bit later as well uh, another question came in uh, Steve comment Mike just yeah. I just wanted to interject that uh, the uh, article uh, Rick that you uh, uh, referenced uh, on the ceramic tile on concrete mangers uh, that was in our February 10th issue this year uh, on page 104 uh, for those that uh, might want to check that out. Go ahead. Another question came in here. What causes cows to produce less saliva when they ruminate while standing versus lying down? Is that right, Rick? Yeah, I didn't mention that today. Um, the data, there, there's some old data about that, and so it, um, I'm not sure if I know 100% what the answer is, but people have measured that uh, there's a slight increase in the rate of salivary production. So I guess it's at the level of the salivary glands as they ruminate when they're lying down versus standing up. Um, I, I don't know if I know the specific reason. I think the other importance, I've always said that rumination lying down is, is, is preferable to rumination while standing up. And part of that is simply because the cows offer feet so you don't have all of the stress on the hoof, right? So I'm not sure if I, if I know or if anybody knows physiologically why that is. Um, but certainly the cow probably evolved to, to prefer rumination while lying down. I mean, basically, ruminants are prey animals, right? Mm -hmm. So their natural inclination is to eat and then go find a safe place, lie down, and then process that feed by ruminating. So to me, it makes sense regardless of what the specific physiology is. Okay, let's move on to my question, actually. It came in two weeks ago, Rick, and that is a person in a stanchion barn said, we have a cow comfort issue here. We're going to put six inches of sand in top of the concrete in the, in the, in the, in the barn, but now the cows are going to be six inches above the manger surface. And he was concerned in terms if that is abnormal, going to cause some abnormal behavior as far as feed consumption, having the cow normally, he said, that uh, the, the manger is... A, slightly raised above the plane of the floor when you look at freestall barns. Your comments. Right. Well, he, he's right about that. And, and there is some older data out there, though, which would indicate that you'll have the optimal dry matter intake from a feed platform, which is about six inches or so above, right, above the, the standing platform of the cow. All right. And so that's, that's true. And without knowing the details, but the fact that he's added sand to try to improve comfort um, so you, you begin to weigh, you know, what's the benefit of the sand and lying time versus a maybe not quite an optimal feeding platform, right? Mm -hmm. and, and certainly he could do something to raise the elevation of the feeding platform in front over time, then get the best of both worlds, have a comfortable resting surface with the sand, but also a slightly elevated feeding platform. I guess if you need the really short-term answer, I've got to believe based on some of the things I've talked about today, if the feed's there, and he may have to change his feeding management a little bit to make sure the cow doesn't have to reach very far for that feed, right? Um, he can compensate for the less than desirable platform height and, and, and still get the benefit of having the sand in the stalls. But his uh, goal ought to be to do something to raise the platform height. 
Right. Okay, another question came in from one of our foreign visitors, and then that is any experience about with uh, densities on compost uh, bedded pack barn systems that are common in the Midwest here, probably more so than maybe New England, maybe New York. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I've, I've never worked or managed or been near a farm that's been like that. Certainly anything I would know would be from reading some of the work from Minnesota and maybe your neck of the woods. And so I wouldn't have any particular, any specific recommendation for that beyond what's generally recommended for cows just in a normal pack setting. Um, I, and I, so I don't feel particularly well qualified to answer that, but at least probably you know, 10 square feet per cow. Uh, maybe, Mike, you could add to that. I don't know. Well, it seems to me, I re recall Mar Marcy Enders had a number, and Dave Fisher picked up on it, 100, 100, 100 square feet. That would be yeah, uh, so 10 square feet. 10, 10 square feet, 100, yep. 125 yeah. was what, the, what they were recommending as far as that goes with yeah. it. But I, I, don't, a, I don't know of any data which has tried to titrate that out. So I, I, I fall back on what's sort of been uh, you know, commonly referred to out there in, 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 you know, in the literature as you know, 100 square feet or you know, 10 by 10, right? Right. Yep. Another question, what type of behavior differences will there be if cows have access uh, to rest and pasture scenario? Okay. So the pasture situation, um, rest is just as important out there. One thing I, I, I didn't mention, um, pasture situations at all, and maybe I should have, but the, the key difference time budget-wise between a pastured animal, assuming there's ample feed resources out there, and cows, either in a tie stall or a free stall, will be the resting time. And, and cows typically spend a lot less time resting on pasture, maybe more like nine hours a day versus the 12 hours per day inside. And it's going to be a function of how long they have to spend grazing. So um, if someone, I've had people say, geez, I've, I look at animals on pasture and they, and they lie down less. Is there something wrong with my pasture? And it really isn't. That's just normal for the cow. It was interesting when we were in New Zealand about six, seven years ago, Rick, there was a comment that well, with their lush pastures, these cows will graze hard for about four hours, mm -hmm. and, and then they, they shut down. Or, uh, and, of course, we've, we, were, we were backing into dry matter intake on that one, but it's interesting when you look at it on the time management one. But, of course, those pastures are, are pretty well-managed pastures oh, you if you've ever been to New Zealand. Uh, interesting question here. What is the? Is there a maximum number of cows per pen to optimize behavior? Otherwise, to minimize consulting and 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 uh, in cow interaction, is there a magic number? That's an interesting question. So, is there is there a magical number to optimize interaction? In other words, can you get too big or can you be too small? I guess. Huh. I, I got to admit, that's the first time someone's asked me that question. Um, but I would guess. On, on the upper side, there's data, actually some of the last work that Jack Albright did before he retired from Purdue, um, he asked the question, can the group size be too big, where the social structure and the normal behavior breaks down, and he, he found within reason that that's not the case, and he looked at herds, I believe, that for pen size went up to almost like 250 cows per pen, and as long as management was up to managing that size pens in terms of time budgeting and so forth, cows interacted as normally there as they did, presumably in, in Tens of you know 50, 50 or less. So, I don't know that there's uh, any any real good answer to that. There's some older ideas in literature that if you got much above 100 cows, that uh, that might be a problem based on the ability of in individuals to recognize other individuals. I'm not so sure that's true. There's certainly not good data on that. Um, on the on the other side, in terms of small pens, um, well, I guess that becomes more less of an animal behavior thing than just really a practical management, right? All right. My opinion. We have another question here that just suddenly moved up on me. <laughs> the use of anti-stress brushes, I assume these are cow grooming brushes he's referring to, could mm -hmm. that reduce the time of resting in free stalls? That would be a concern because cows are, are standing there brushing themselves? <laughs> no kidding. Uh, that's great. I can picture those things, too, especially the ones that rotate, right? Cows <laughs> will stand around quite a long time to use those. I think that, that effect is more exaggerated when they're first installed, probably. Uh, to me, the short answer, and again, this is just based on my gut instinct. I don't believe there's any real solid data out there, but my gut instinct is uh, those self-grooming uh, things are a great idea, whether they're mechanical or not. And I can't imagine, under most conditions, that would, that would seriously impact resting time. Um, but I'd also hasten to add, because sometimes you see people try to advertise those based on some large increase in milk production and so forth, and the data there would would be pretty weak just 
to buy those, uh, expecting a measurable performance response. But I think it's also we know that grooming is a behavioral need of the cow, so we would recommend putting them in. Another question. Uh, Rick, for, go ahead, Steve. Oh, oh, I'm just going to say, Rick, we're right at the end of the hour, and we certainly encourage uh, those uh, uh, listeners to stay with us if they have uh, want to hear some more discussion. But I, I you know, uh, before some uh, have to tune out, uh, I want to thank you so much for an excellent, well prepared uh, presentation, Rick. It was uh, it was great, and I thank all of our attendees uh, as well, and especially uh, uh, Mike for your uh, co your uh, hosting, and Muriel and their uh, best in class dairies uh, program for their their support. And, uh, and again, uh, um, Rick made some reference to heat stress, and uh, our uh, June 13th uh, webinar will be on heat stress by uh, Lance uh, uh, Baumgard from Iowa State, who has some interesting uh, data to share with us, uh, and I invite people back to listen to that. So uh, with that, uh, go ahead, and we'll continue to uh, uh, take uh, some questions, and as long as people want to stay with us. Very good. Well, Steve, thanks again to Horst Dairyman and uh, as well as Marielle for the continued support of, of this, these series of activities with our fine turnout today. I think what we'll do is answer the questions that are on the screen. I think we have about four or five left to go here okay. uh, at this point, Rick. So uh, this one I'm a little confused on, but I'll read it to you. Maybe you've seen it as well. Reference to uh, slides uh, eight and nine. Uh, maybe I missed the point, but it, it seems I seem but I seem to understand that mixing cows and heifers, the heifers got more resting time as they're on a higher pace. But yet the general trend, as you said later, heifers suffer more from higher stocking densities. Any, any comments on that? Uh, I might need to re uh, just back up a little bit. I can do that, can't I? To go back to the slide and see what he's referring yes, to? Yes, you can. All right, I'm going to do that. Uh, back to slide eight or nine he's referring to, right? Yes, that is correct. This is slide six, seven, eight. Okay, so this is talking about, all right, so could you repeat the question now, Mike? Yeah, the, the question said reference to slide, uh, uh, slides eight and nine, uh -huh. and, and he was wondering, it looked like heifers had more, had more time to rest, and then he said, but later on you indicate this, isn't, this is not true. Oh, I bet he's, maybe it's confusion about what I'm pointing to right now, if people yeah. can still see the slide. Um, this, this is the increase in resting time, and so um, the heifer, this, this heifers gained four hours per day of rest when they had ample access to the stalls. The cows gained 2.6 hours a day rest, and so the target may be not much different, 12 hours per day. It might be a little bit, a little bit different for the first calf heifers, but the point here is that the heifers were getting shortchanged a lot more on total resting time. So they increased a lot more when that uh, limitation was removed by uh, giving them more time in the pen. Maybe that makes more, that's a better way to explain it. Uh, Mike and, and Rick, we did have a question regarding uh, whether the presentations will be archived and all of the webinars that we do uh, are available uh, by going to forge.com and clicking on our webinar link and uh, you will be able to view past web, uh, webinars as, uh, as well as this one. So okay. I can take care of that question. Very good. And that was the question we were doing hand signals over here at the studio. Thanks, Steve, very much for that. And, and, and also be aware that the, the, the other webinars are also there if they wish to go back. Isn't that true, Steve, that they're also? That's right. They're all there. So at this point now, I think we have a, a bank of five webinars that cover a variety. So we welcome you listeners. If you miss some of the early webinars, go to the Hordes website, and uh, you'll, you'll find some interesting ones on the 400,000 somatic cell count thing, which <clears throat> we'll leave that one alone right now, Steve, won't we? And uh, certainly questions about milk marketing uh, plans and, right. and feeding and, and stuff some like of that. Those things are, are still topical. Still topical. Uh, do you believe, uh, another quick question as we wrap up here, and that is, do you believe cows develop different tolerances for noise and movement and stress if they've been, uh, if, if when they were raised as calves, or ex they were exposed to those same levels of, of noise and management and people? Do you think there's a carryover there? Well, there might be. <clears throat> Again, I, it, I don't know of any study that would that looked at that specifically. But it would, it would make sense based on some of the things we know about animals that they can, they certainly can learn and they can adapt to environments, right? 
And so some cows would be more uh, adaptable to that than others. It, it still may have an overall negative effect on some aspect of their health or performance, but they still could uh, deal with it better. Does that make sense? Yep. And, and just one more quick thing. Some people I, I visit would talk about the city cow versus country cow analogy. I'm not entirely sure I, I buy that, but people say that, you know, the city cow is the one that's raised in, you know, over, overcrowded, you know, hectic sort of conditions like New York City or I guess Chicago out in your neck of the woods versus the poor little country cow that if you take that cow from an understocked barn and, and, and someone buys her and puts her into 120% stocked conditions, she may fall apart, right? So there, there, I think there's some just empirical evidence for that, but I, I don't know of any study that actually shows that. Rick, can you go back to the final slide again? We'll just put up the uh, the, the the thank you slide at the end, if, we, if you if you would please. Uh, you're in control. And finally, there there's one final question here at this point. What is your preferred number of movements from pen to pen in the transition period? Some people uh, have suggested uh, it's got a bad reputation to uh, to when in terms of moving to maternity pens and close-up pens and fresh cow pens and stuff like that. Your thoughts, Rick? Well, my, my bias is that uh, if you need a, you know, if you, if you put the cow in the maternity pen just for the act of, of parturition, then it, I think functionally for that cow, it doesn't really count as a pen move. In other words, she's just in there for a matter of hours. And so you, you, you talk about going from the far off to the close up is one pen move. She's in and out of the maternity area pretty quick. <clears throat> then she moves to the fresh pen. So there's, there's basically two pen, major pen moves in that pen, span of time. I think if you can stay at that, you're, you're good because there's a data set I didn't show today which shows in terms of, you know, metabolic and other health disorders. If you get above two, you, you basically double the risk of, of uh, things such as a DA and other metabolic problems. If you stay two or less, then it, it's much more, I guess, desirable in terms of the incidence of, of metabolic problems. So, Rick? Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Did, no, you, have, did you finish? Okay. Uh, we still have a fair number of uh, participants with us, which uh, uh, we appreciate, we're gratified by. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, at, at the horse farm here, we have been uh, kind of gotten in the habit of measuring production by, in our case, the pounds, pounds of fat and protein produced per cow, or uh, excuse me, pounds produce per stall per day to sort of uh, combine our stocking rate or our productive efficiency you know in some sort of a benchmark um, the last couple of times I've calculated that we were somewhere around 5.44 uh, once uh, 5.36 pounds of fat and protein uh, per stall per day uh, a measure like that of course there's a lot of noise in a number like that but how uh, how uh, how would you react to that as sort of a benchmark thing, as a way to put some economics and, you know, overall facility or system uh, efficiency to, in, in some perspective? I think that I think that makes sense, Steve. And and actually, uh, again, I pulled out some different slides, but I've other talks where I focused more just on stocking density. The slide I pulled sort of talks about the you know the financial aspects of that or the economic consequences of of different stocking densities. And I guess to me the neat thing, <clears throat> if you can imagine superimposing, you know, a, a chart which shows the effect of some behavior or performance on a cow basis as stocking density goes up, it tends to drop off as you get above about 120 percent or thereabouts. And I kind of and I alluded to that. What's neat is any financial data set I've looked at, um, whether it's public or or not, <clears throat> tends to show about the same thing. So it's comforting that uh, whether it's on a cow or a stall basis. The economic returns tend to to uh, max out or, or to drop off at about the same time that we see drop offs in some measure of, of cow response, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you, you use pounds of, of uh, fat and protein. You can use other things, but on a on a stall basis, I think that still that you know 120 percent or thereabouts is what I've seen in terms of being the critical point, whether it's an economic based measure or <clears throat> excuse me, a cow based measure. Right. Rick, the other thing I was kind of curious about is what things more do you think we need to learn, uh, you know, on this topic in general in terms of uh, cow behavior, stocking density, and so forth. I guess maybe another way of, of saying this is what kinds of things are you you wanting to research yourself, or, or people like UBC and other institutions looking at? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I think well, there's, there's a couple things. One is <clears throat> we need to keep doing this, not only for, you know to, to look at profitability and, and improving cow performance, but we all know, and you've had any number of articles and hordes about you know the welfare issues that surround us in the big picture, right? And auditing. So what can we do to make sure that our, our herds are in fact uh, managed for optimum profitability as well as the welfare status of the cows? But what we're looking at, what others are looking at, to me personally, a real big area of interest is what's the interaction between stocking density or just more generally the management environment of the cow and the diet? Because <clears throat> we know, for instance, if you had a TMR that was adequate in effective fiber and adequate in unsaturated fatty acids, as two examples, right? The cows are going to perform much different on that diet at 120% stocking rate than they would be if you had suddenly one that was high in oil or low in fiber, right? So we have to find out more about that stocking density or management and diet interaction, especially for trying to model. And specifically, where we're trying to go with this is to put together better management and nutrition models so that we can better manage and feed our cows. Um, <clears throat> I think that, to me, that's sort of the holy grail is if you can take um, some of the current models that are out there and have inputs not only for a nutritional uh, parameters, but also have inputs for stocking density, have inputs for grouping strategy, and just do a better job with, with managing our cows overall. Um, Very good. Yeah. Well, uh, Rick, thanks again for your great job. Mike, uh, any final thoughts uh, from you? No, we're in good shape, Steve. We'll let you, uh, I think, uh, wind this thing up here. Uh, we've answered all the questions that were in before 1 o'clock, and I think that's kind of our goal at this stage of the game. So, again, Steve, we'll turn it back to you. Thanks, and have a okay. good week. Well, thank you, Mike, uh, for your help. Again, Rick, great job. We, we're glad to have you part of the uh, webinar program. Uh, we, again, thank uh, Muriel for their support and invite people to join us on June 13th when uh, uh, Elenco will be sponsoring uh, Lance Baumgart. Uh, as we dig into heat stress and uh, what we can do about it. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.